I literally lost two kilograms preparing this thing. Okay. So do I look okay at this profile or this profile? No, no. Uh, jokes aside, uh, firstly, welcome Esther to Kuching for the first time. And Moon, you did very well. You've learned from the best. Dato Sri John Lau. Okay, uh, I think um, it's a bit of a homecoming for me uh, because as I was preparing this, um, I won't call it a public lecture but more a private sharing. Um, but before I begin, maybe just want to take the opportunity to uh, thank WAK, What About Kuching, all right, for organizing this in conjunction with World Architecture Day. Uh, and also to uh, our PAM uh, Sarawak chapter for uh, organizing this exhibition. It's a month long exhibition, so it's upstairs. You can uh, uh, have a look at um, the works of architects. All right, so I think today I, I like to take it maybe in a slightly different slant uh, rather than uh, focusing on just the building. Um, Maybe we can focus behind um, the, the people behind the building, the story of our lives, okay? the architects. Since it's your day, you are the celebrity for the month. So, okay, I'll, I'll start if I can get the projector thing working. Okay, well, since you are architects, the celebrity of the month, I thought I'd start with this. Uh, particular picture of uh, uh, Marion Monroe. Uh, this, uh, if you know, it's a very famous work by Andy Warhol, uh, done in 1960s. Uh, it's actually the beginning of the pop art movement. And uh, the, the painting is uh, very famous because it was actually done two weeks after Marion Monroe committed suicide. Right? Uh, it's a commentary about celebrity, about uh, the era of mass production, um, but in an interesting way, because of how Andy Warhol used string uh, technique, he changed the color slightly. He kind of dehumanized the person and in a way iconized the product. Right? In a way, he took the human out of her and she became like a product. And, um, but we know that behind the faces was actually the story of like real success and in a way also real struggles. In, in a very interesting twist, I, I thought maybe I would do the same thing in that by playing with the colours uh, of the building, offsetting in a different hue, maybe in a way it will de-emphasise architecture and ask you to focus on the people behind making a building. And I thank Woon for really sharing. Um, you know, there's so much technicalities uh, in the pro production of architecture. It's so technical. And honestly, to just say that it is the work of an architect, it's just not true. Lah, no? It's actually done by many, many people. And uh, there are many stakeholders, including clients, specialists, and all that. And there are human stories to be told. So today, I'm going to just maybe share my own personal journey. And for that, I, I need to thank Min uh, for, for the invitation. Um, I think we go a long way back and I'm so glad I, I, I could see all my former colleagues and of course my, my boss as well. So I, I really wanted to just make this more a personal sharing and I'm originally from Penang, but I'm really honoured and privileged that you consider me as local. <laughs> Alright? So I'm going to call it local perspective. And I've been here for a uh, good, in fact, this year, it's my 30th year in Sarawak. I came here in 1989. So I got to start from the beginning, okay? So the, the guy in the middle is considered... Uh, we, we generally call him like the godfather of architecture, right? Rightly so, okay? But uh, it's 
a picture that brought back a lot of memory. And um, I have photographic evidence that, that in fact, mean look much better now. Lah, huh? <laughs> okay? All right. And, and you, could, you could see behind Min is uh, my uh, current partner, Huang. Um, and, and you may not see him, but behind the two ladies, there's a very shy guy by the name of Wong Kyung. All right? You, you can see uh, he's just clipped be, between in the middle, somewhere there. And uh, that's me. And I think Louis uh, is in there. I, I think Compliant Design was, in a way, the... Um, um, one, one of the firms that had molded many, many of us, and many architects today owe uh, debt to Dato Sri John Lau for his mentorship, tutelage, and obviously, I think um, he has guided even now the young generation. I think for that, I think he deserves uh, acknowledgement. Uh -huh. right. Uh, when I first came here, I, I was very privileged to work on uh, my first project. Oh, I need to mention Mr. Wong uh, King Hu, uh, whom when I first came, I bumped in his guest room. Yeah. And then they put me up at Taman Sri Sarawak. How cruel. <laughs> okay, but when I was here, uh, my first job uh, that I was very, very fortunate to do was uh, Taman Sri, uh, uh, not, not Taman Sri Sarawak, sorry, Taman Kereta. And uh, of course, uh, I, I was originally asked to be here for two, two years and because I did this project, I wanted to see it to the end. And of course, I also got married uh, after the first year of working. So I was also quite busy working on another project called LIFE. All right? And uh, the LIFE came through. Uh, Joyce, my daughter, was actually born um, about a week on the time when that building was completed. So that's how the, uh, the building and Joyce I usually call it my first born son. Okay? Okay. So, um, very graciously, and I think this is part and parcel of growing uh, process. And as we, we were very happy working in compliance design, it's a very challenging environment. We were given a lot of room. And I think there we began to um, appreciate collaborative effort uh, by that, that time, it was not called AKDI. It was called Kumpulan Design. All right? Kumpulan meaning it's a group practice. Design being the emphasis. And, and I think a lot of us, myself, Min, Wong Kyung, and many of us, I think we were encouraged actually to collaborate. And there was something that was in our DNA. And, and as part and parcel of growth, by the time around year 2000, a few of us, we felt... Um, no, it's not that we're not unhappy. It's just that we wanted to, to also have a chance of um, doing something of our own, you know, drive your own, be on the driver's seat, chart your own ground and all that. So a few of us con conspired. Oh, sorry, uh, we all um, came together. Uh, and then we set up the firm Design Network Architects in the year 2000. Right? It's, it's a very, very amazing team, I, I would say till today, it was the dream team. Alright, we, we, we had all the people there and later on we are joined with many, many talented young people and there's a lot of talent in Sarawak, I must say. Um, we are joined later on uh, by Mingyi Suchi, um, who now heads MNSC and uh, Leong Alin, uh, SML Architects. And, and they were the, the, the junior partners, you know, who came in. And we had many, many architects who in turn uh, with us and then eventually became architects. We've got some, uh, our friend Henry or C. I mean, there's so many of them and who have interned in the office. And it's a very dynamic team. And then during that 15 years, I think there was a lot of things that managed to, to do. Oh, sorry, I almost forgot. Now, like the, the, the progress of time, I think we understood how people felt. And uh, in the year two, 2015, we, we, we restructured, all right? And every, everyone parted on a, a very good note and they pursued their own direction. And for that, we can understand. So those who were left from the first setup, all right? Yeah. And, and one... 
very profound truth that I learned through this episode is that a dog is still the man's best friend. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, we really um, enjoyed collaboration. So we never stopped collaborating. And even till today, we still collaborate with different friends. And uh, these are some of our partners in KL that we still collaborate with on projects, on a project-to-project basis. And, and we still collaborate with a lot of other architects here in Kuching. So just um, some faces. Uh, some of them you may know, some you do not know. We have people whom uh, we collaborate with in KL if they are doing work in Penang or K, uh, KL or other parts. So just very quick acknowledgement. Uh, we have a very small uh, presence in Melbourne uh, through our... Okay, this partner, I'm a bit suspicious of him because... He, he said he liked my work and all that, but actually in the end, I found out he liked my daughter, actually. Okay? So next year, it's going to be family. All right? He's the guy in the middle. Okay, but uh, seriously speaking, John is a very, very talented person that I've got to know in Melbourne who, who uh, we now collaborate on many jobs. We'll show some of them. Okay? And um, I'm not sure whether she's here. Wendy, I think over the years, we have... Um, and enjoyed the collaborative, uh, kind of like brainstorming together with uh, architect Wendy Teo. Uh, and she's the founder of Borneo Art Collective. And I think in a way, with her, uh, it helped us look at um, perhaps exploring the Borneo narrative a little bit more. Okay, looking at what um, Borneo has to offer for us. Um, of course, with the new generation, we had to say, hey, my titi chia 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 la chokang. Okay? So we have new partners. We uh, enjoy um, the collaboration. Mervin is uh, one of our current uh, partners now. Obviously, he loves Duran. Some of you may know Jay Tat, uh, who are also from Sarawak. So we find, our, find ways to um, not just do work, but enjoy ourselves. La, no? I think at the end of the day, um, Working as an architect is stressful enough. I think to have a team to work together uh, has been um, making it a little bit more enjoyable. Um, I'm going to show some of the works very briefly because I think they are actually quite well covered. I think the work of DNA over the years has been uh, covered quite a lot. I think Min has also done a great uh, job in, uh, over the years inviting different ones. So you do know the work, so I'm not going to spend too much time. But maybe just to add on that, I think a lot of times, and today's public lecture is open to the public, and since we are talking about celebrating local architects, I've, I've thought about maybe sharing with you some of the motivations behind architectural work rather than what the work is about. I think for architects, right, um, of course they're always inspired by ideas, uh, but if you really look at it, architects are actually much more than just that. They are not just an idea person. They are very, very technical. In fact, we are professionals. We provide professional consultancy. And we are committed to our clients, actually. So we work together with clients and with a lot of suppliers, builders, to deliver an end product. And it takes a lot of time to actually do them, all right? So a lot of times, um, we, we, are, we are inspired Yes, no doubt by an idea, but essentially the thing that makes up architecture is still the commitment to building and to see how ideas can be transformed into reality. So I think DNA's DNA, at the heart of it, it's about trying to push different conventions, trying to find solutions to local condition, okay? architectural solution that is responsive to Sarawak's climate, social, economic situation. And in search of a local identity, all right? And uh, a lot of people, perhaps, uh, and, and there's not a criticism, um, sometimes in the search of identity, we can be superficial, all right? We can be superficial, so we, we just in a way, take a symbolic approach to something, just like if you, but um, just like 
taking a form, but it's never really just about the form, but it's more about the essence. So, architects takes inspiration from every sort of um, work. Um, artwork sometimes can be a starting point. So, um, I'm actually very, very um, interested in the work by this guy, a French artist by the name of Bernard Pras. You may want to Google him. He, he produced a lot of these drawings, right? That you've seen from a certain vintage point, it looks like a drawing, but when you look close up, right, it consists of throw-away things, toilet papers, you know, all sorts of things. But seen in the angle, you could see the composition of it. So these anamorphic drawings are a way that he uses um, a visual point and by allowing you to look at certain things, you begin um, to see a certain picture. All right? So this is uh, one of the things that could be an inspiration to architects as a starting point. So sometimes when we talk about ideas, we could do something like that. We could actually talk to the clients um, about a starting point to sell a certain idea. Uh, so for a project that we're doing, and um, I changed the color of the building a bit so that you won't know what it is and where it is. <laughs> okay? I, I think we were asked to do, and the building is not done by us, but we were asked to do a super graphic uh, fa uh, feature, la, a facial kind of thing. So we actually good, uh, and you see architects often doing this kind of thing. And uh, in a lot of public talks, you will see these kind of things, they will flash an idea, and, and it, it looks almost simplistic. But that's just an idea. But behind it, there is the wound. I'm sure he worked with the specialists on the museum, and so many technical things that is achieved, all right? So today, I really want to just take our time to honour the people who did a lot of the works that was done by DNA. Um, because um, credit should be given to those who did all the different work. I was fortunate to be part of it. So I'm, I'm going to very quickly uh, just go through some projects. You may be familiar, there are many of them. And over the years, DNA has built many. And I'm just going to just by mean of acknowledgement you know, Chinese, they're saying, uh, there's an old Chinese idiom that says, yin sui si yuan. Literally meaning that uh, when you drink the water, you acknowledge the source. All right? So, there are, there are many, many buildings that is done in collaboration. I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but if you like, there are some very interesting stories behind this particular building that myself, mean. Huang and Min um, work together. This is one of our bigger commission that help us pay some bills uh, in the very, very beginning. Um, so there's a, very, there's a very interesting story about practice. If, if someone reminds me in the question later on, I'll tell you about it. But again, uh, when, we, when we are looking at buildings, we, we often talk about big ideas. And, and these are some of the big ideas that DNA developed over the years. It is always about how a building could be used to frame something. All right? How it addresses the urban situation, the local condition. And there's a local context. And the architect is given a local challenge. And then we give a local proposition. So for the Irish Hotel, four, uh, four star, 210, huh? Uh, Wong, Wong Kiong, I think he was the lead person. This is the first time I went for a meeting completely in Fuchao. <laughs> I learned Fuchao through writing the minutes. <laughs> All right. And uh, it, uh, there's a very interesting story. I don't have time because, but if you, you want to know, you ask me later on, I'll tell you the story. It's very, very hila hilarious. Okay, but um, Wong Kiong, Min, Huang, myself, I think, and the whole office worked on this project. It was I think truly one of the more collaborative projects that we did. Uh, sorry. Um, of course, we are very privileged to do many, many houses, of which I think it always was about not so much just the outlook of the form, the modern looking. This house was done by Arlene. Uh, I'm not sure whether she's here. Uh, Arlene and uh, 
And it was a house that really explored a certain kind of typology. And um, you, you see this kind of flat roof all the time now, but I can tell you when we first proposed it in the very, very first time, when uh, Ming Yi and Su Chi worked on 7th Avenue housing, you know, it was shot down uh, many, many times, you know, and eventually it, it was privileged to be built by, uh, by another client. Uh, but the, the whole idea about the pitch roof, celebrating the courtyard, um, all, all these things, I think it was developed during those 15 years and we were together. Of course, we took the... Um, we had a lot, a lot of houses to do. And uh, this is a house done by Ming Yi. Um, I'm not sure Su Chi was involved, but I think predominantly Ming Yi. Which really looked at reimagining the whole Si He Yuan, the courtyard houses. One of the features in DNA's work was the consistent use of courtyards as a central focus. And that's, I think that's really uh, first principle sustainability. La. Because if you can naturally ventilate a house, then why aircon it in the first place? But it doesn't mean that it's wrong to aircon it. So the courtyard has been one of the typologies that's been used to bring light in, to, to, to allow airflow and to become a lot of times, center of a range, uh, a rival. So, um, and, and all these projects they are in Kuching, you probably have seen it, you probably read about it. And um, the, the Cebu Heritage Center, it's, um, I think, one of the more challenging projects where we just oppose the old and the new. And this job was, uh, I think, led by Min with a group of very, uh, the interns Together with all the design architects, Ming Yi, Su Chi was involved. Ting Leong, Alin, Wong Kiong obviously was the Fu Chao translator, uh, and uh, Huang and myself. And I think it was a, a wonderful project uh, that we have been able to do. La. And um, uh, the ABF, uh, Leong and Min took the lead on this project. And again, it was about reusing the O how we repurpose an old office building uh, so that it's about building frugally, all right? It's about using resources in a clever way. And, and, and that speaks a lot, you know, that speaks a lot. It's not just about like doing a new building, but how can you um, reuse your resources in an efficient way? And I think those thinking uh, form the basis of DNA's DNA. I think at the end of the day, we are not just interested in building. We are interested about making design. And design is about enhancing value. It may not mean you build more, but you give more value. And uh, I think all these projects, they really help us explore a kind of architecture that is very, very local. Because in Sarawak, we have challenges, no doubt. We may not have all the resources, but I can tell you, we surely have a lot of the talents, all right? So for this, for the 15 years, I, I really want to honour all these people, okay? So give yourself a big clap if you are part of DNA before, all right? And, and of course, with the current setup, I think we are not slowing down. In fact, we are still pushing through. And, and we, we are open about collaboration, right? We, we, we have worked with uh, different firms in Kuching itself, and we, I think uh, we enjoyed that very much. Um, I'll, I'll very quickly just run through uh, with you some of the newer jobs that is currently going. So we've chosen three jobs um, that maybe gives you a bit of a range. Right? One is a detached house, all right? uh, so it's considered a bit like a luxury product. The second project is actually a housing um, not particular public housing, but still fairly luxurious housing, but housing nonetheless uh, for the public, for community. And, and last project is actually a project done by the interns, by the students in the office. And it's actually a project in a, a rural uh, area near uh, Miri called Long Lamam. So I'll just quickly run through with you. And I want to share with you not just um, the work that we do, but the people that are involved and, and I want you to perhaps appreciate the, 
the process of which how architects work. Lah. So uh, the first project, um, we just call it Bonio Mansion, and I'll be very honest with you, it's an afterthought. All right, it's an afterthought. Uh, we we name it, originally it was called Concrete House. Uh, but at the time, I think Ming Yi was doing another concrete house. So I think uh, this was actually the second concrete house that DNA was uh, involved in. And we, okay, I'm, I'm um, perhaps a bit more visual. I like to look at something and perhaps be a starting point to inspire something that one do. I, I was very taken by this painting by Raphael Scott Abeng. Um, of, I think it's about the Mulu caves, but I'm not sure about it. But I think the, the big idea was this, that when we look at Borneo, right, um, just Borneo itself, it's been so inspiring. We, we, have, we have the colours of Borneo, we have the land, uh, mass of the, the flora, the fauna. It's such a rich place, you know. And I think this, this drawing, I, it really in, inspired me because of the way it captures all the lines and the shadows and, and just the brightness of the colour. It, it, it's something that when I looked at it, I was immediately stricken by it. I, I love this guy's work. La. Chen Li, some of you all know him. He has done a lot of exhibition at um, the courthouse. And if you look at his photography, right, it's amazing, you know. We have such a rich texture in our landscape, something so diverse. And I was very taken by this image because essentially it showed how the green, kind of like it was naturally tucked in between all the solids. And even as the picture is damn poetic, you know. And we are looking at, isn't that something that we could really inspire us and about? about what we do, you know? can there be a contrast of the green and the texture? And, and the, the Borneo rainforest, I think there was um, a session when we did the B lab, uh, the Borneo lab, we were talking with students about how do we reimagine our rainforest, our jungle, the ephemeral qualities of it, how the sun comes and the shadow shifts, the layering of the anamorphic, like how you look at a picture, right, in a varying layering. So the, the, the forests have a lot of that kind of quality. So I, I think when we were doing this house, right, um, I think one of the things that, it's also because the client is the interior designer, so he demanded something more. And, and it was really a, a project that we wanted to be very bold, working with a uh, very unconventional material. And we wanted to challenge the notion that detached house need not be luxurious because of its finishing, you know, marble, expensive stuff, but can we actually be luxurious in terms of the spaces that we build? Can we look at how buildings function and can that be reimagined? Right? Not direct copying, not symbolically copying, but functionally responding to, to climate, and by taking inspiration from the pictures. So the house is actually at Lorong Batukawa 1, I think it's not very far. May I just have a show of hands? How many have been there? Okay, there was actually a visitation, so I just want to know how many. Uh, it's not very far away, you can actually go and you can see it. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting house because it's actually originally designed as three houses. All right, yeah. And this house that was built is the first of a series of three. Um, it's um, double fronted, meaning it actually has two roads, front and back. And the legal entrance from the back actually is via a row of terrace houses. Okay? Um, so we are looking at how can we, uh, when we design a house, and this is something what architects do, is that we want to design holistically. Even though it's one house, we design the three houses as an integrated whole. Meaning the house by itself also have uh, pocket gardens that you can borrow from next door. Meaning how you see your next door uh, matters to, to you. So if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, you can see how the green spaces 
and the blue spaces, the pools, they interlock. As in, if I'm from my bedroom, I could see your green. Kind of like a borrowed landscape. Kind of like you help me, I help you. All right? Similar, huh? And, and we, we explore many, many ideas, you know? And uh, we, we were very fortunate because uh, years ago, we worked with a Malaysian uh, designer. Many of you know who, we, who he is, but uh, without disclosing names, uh, we were working on a project in Cebu, and uh, we actually explored the house with the double roof in our tropical climate, right? You know, it's so hot. So um, this house actually had double roofs, meaning that the top roof able to shade the roof underneath. Right? So the underneath roof is done using concrete. The top roof is using uh, metal. In between, there is a layer of space, uh, you know, air that can pass through. And we wanted the building, and this is one of the things that I think DNA is also pushing the limit, is that why do you always have to plaster the, the walls? Right? That's one of the things. You spend so much time building up the brick, and then you plaster it like mascara like that. All right. Wouldn't it be nicer if you just left it as it is? Wouldn't it be faster? So uh, we explore tactile material, the texture. And in this case, we actually exposed the brick. Um, and we also looked at how our courtyards actually can be made to work for the tenant so that you can lock up, open up the the doors and windows towards the courtyard and you have natural ventilation. But you can still air condom. So there, a lot of this concept uh, that was explored um, and we took the idea forward into this house. Of course, this house, you won't see it from the top. Uh, you see it's like a single roof, but in fact, it's actually a double roof uh, design. It has a metal roof and it has an air gap. It has a concrete uh, top. So we are really working um, on a very simple plan one of the things that DNA uh, would like to really explore is about how people experience the building, viscerally going through it, the ambience. So we wanted to um, incorporate a very simple plan that can allow people to experience the journey, meaning from where you park your car, how you enter in, going into the space, the openness, the quality of the light, the quality of the air, the volumes. So it's a very, very simple plan. It basically is two blocks with a courtyard in the middle. All right, it's very simple. And you see the living room and the dining room, there's a courtyard in the middle. All the rooms are flanked onto one side so that they can ha have the borrowed view of next door. All right, uh, so it kind of like repeats itself. So everyone have their own view. Very simple, we deliberately made the plan very simple so that we can build it using very unconventional material, which is concrete, all right? Um, we love plants, uh, okay? I think landscape is such a big part of the work that we do. So the journey is actually um, animated by green. So we, as much as we can, we slot green in between spaces, a bit like the picture I showed you, the greens get slot in between the solids, all right? So the house is uh, pretty long. It actually has a front and a back entrance. So the front uh, is not the legal road, so council don't allow us to park our car, but nothing stopping us to do a pedestrian entrance, all right? The back is where you park your car and you come from the back, all right? Now, uh, because my client is an interior designer, he has lots of stuff. He traveled widely. He said, why don't I use the house also as my studio? So it works very well. The, the front that faces the main road where you can't park your car becomes kind of like his studio. And the back um, where he parks his car, that living room becomes like a family room. So um, uh, quite a long plan. And we actually modularized the concrete panels to... Uh, four by eight panels, the size of a plywood, so that we can recycle the plywood as we build. Eventually, after you finish your roof, you can throw away the plywood because it's been used three times. So we had all these like grand ideas, lah, you know, of trying to make the construction 
more um, cost efficient. Okay, this is a very quick section showing the, um, the volumes uh, and you can see that's uh, a double roof system, the top. And now uh, we took great pain to coordinate all the pipings, the M&E, especially to make sure that uh, when we took down the ceiling, all the M&E were all preset. And you don't see any pipes, uh, floor trap pipes from upstairs, uh, aircon, uh, we had to precast all the coolant pipes. In. So it was a challenge la, nonetheless. I think people have done concrete structures. You could probably identify with that. Right, so this is just a very quick uh, isonometric of all the different components that came together. Now, in a way, this reminds me of the anamorphic drawing. You know, like when you look at architecture, right, maybe sometimes you just see a certain image and you think that's architecture. But if you see from the side, right, it's really about total integration. It's about M&E, the structural engineer, the landscaper, the interior, everyone coming together in a total vintage point. And you see the end product. So that's the point I'm trying to say that essentially it's... Um, it's an effort, a good effort, and here I need to give credit to the contractors. So when we started construction, um, and those who are in construction, you know how difficult it is. We have to make sure things are coordinated. There is a, a lesson that we learn when we do uh, concrete construction is that from our previous projects that uh, I think Ming Yi did the concrete house, we had great difficulty coordinating the M&E especially the electrical and the aircon. That's, that's because those components involve the client at the very end during ID. And if you have done any buildings before, you know that when they come to switches, come to sockets, man, it's a nightmare. All right, things get changed, left, right, center, and all that. So you can't change them if you do an off-form construction. So what we did was that we localized the electrical component so that they are not cast in the wall, they come up from the floor. Now that has a few advantages is that you can always decide how you want to do your switches much later. So it's about an understanding about sequencing, it's about understanding about construction. And, and behind every architect, right, there's something, a great, great appreciation um, that I feel a lot of times uh, is not mentioned because I think architects, right, you do a hell lot of coordination drawing every time you build something. So the front, the public domain has two fronts, so they have slightly different outlook, and the back. So the pedestrian entrance, as you come in, you are, you are fronted with a building and one of the reasons why you used the concrete was also because the left and right was more or less facing east-west, right? And um, the screen was actually diagonally facing west. So we needed to have something that could shield the afternoon sun. And, and this is an afterthought. Lah. I think the whole um, uh, screen design was, of course, inspired by Mulu case, but it's not a direct copy. Lah. It was really the most efficient way to do a screen without using solid member. This whole screen was done using a perforated screen. So the geometry is derived from the structure. Right? The night, um, because it's, um, it's facing the not so desirable neighborhood, we actually designed the, the wet area to, to face at the back, but screened by a lot of trees and the car porch. If you have the opportunity to visit the house, you'll realize that the moving shadow is one of the things how the sun casts its shadow on the building. It's one of the character of how this architecture works. It's a cons consistent changing of um, the whole ambience at different times of the year. And, and landscape is actually used to, to full effect when we, when we do that. 
The other thing was that uh, we wanted to define luxury in a different way. Instead of using expensive material, can we define luxury in terms of space? All right. A lot of times when we design buildings, we have negative spaces like courtyards. They are ne negative spaces. There's nothing there. But it doesn't mean it doesn't have any value. In fact, I think negative spaces is worth a lot more than just positive spaces. So we have all these big courtyard spaces, which we call them outdoor rooms. Uh. They are really transitional zones between indoor and outdoor. And the, the outdoor rooms, in fact, are our main focus. And it can be used for a variety of things. It could be like poolside. It can be used uh, as a, a, a visual focus um, by just how you plan your design. So we have a pool site um, at um, uh, Lab Pool, and we, we, we deliberately designed it as a transitional space that people could go out. In. It's another room, la, so to speak, that people can use. Now, uh, the client is an interior designer, so he collects all this stuff, you know. And a lot of times when we do concrete houses, and if you are very, very um, used to looking at this very fancy, minimalist interior, right? Normally, when they do concrete house, they want to be very minimalist. Furniture from Airbnb, space, but cost like, damn a lot. So, our, our, we wanted not to fall into that trap. Lah. We wanted to contrast. Lah. Can't we contrast lah, the old and the new, the rustic and the polished? Do we always need to do something like so minimal? Can we do something that's much more rich, more eclectic? So, we took a, a big challenge. We, um, we really used a lot of colours for the interior. And, uh, and, and tried it out. So this is actually one of the views of the, the master bedroom that's built. And, and if you look carefully at it, there are many, many materials. But the thing that struck me more is how the sunlight comes in from the side and washes the wall. A very Tadao Ando thing about how he uses light. Right? And it really creates a kind of ambience where um, it allows... Um, a kind of calmness. Lah. Okay? Yet at the same time, I think it captures something about our um, Borneo aesthetic. I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm making sense here. But it has a certain quality that's very uniquely, I felt, Sarawakian. Um, one of the things is, of course, the light and um, how the light comes through the building and the, the external. The second project that we are uh, talking about would be um, still luxury, okay? We call it lux prison, but I think luxury in terms of how public housing can utilize clever planning and make spaces that works better and foster community. We, we are very, very fortunate um, to uh, be involved with uh, our client, uh, Hock Sing Lee, on this project. And uh, this project was actually uh, phase two of a master plan that um, is at La Promenade, Kota Sumarahan. And uh, we were asked to do this project actually on a follow-through from very successful phase one, actually. All right? And um, so the stakes are high, and we wanted really to innovate, um, to do something that is different. Um, the phase one was detached houses and uh, semi Ds, but phase two, we wanted to make uh, another product that was perhaps more easy entry point to different... Uh, uh, we, are, we are targeting young generation, uh, younger working people with two children, something like that. A smaller family, people who are looking at staying in the a township, uh, yet at the, the same time able to come in at an, a certain entry point. So when we did this project, we actually inherited the master plan that was done by um, uh, Unireka. And, uh, and a lot of the, I, I must say there's a lot of good 
planning strategies that's incorporated there, so credit is due to them. But it, essentially, when we inherited the project, it was all planned out. Lah, right? So I think one of the challenges uh, architects face about doing uh, public housing is the monotony of the same. Right? Everything is in rows, and here we have like rows and rows and uh, rows of eight terrace houses, and they are all arranged in kind of like a factory-like situation, anchored by a main axis, and with all the green spaces in between. Um, so we, we were um, re-looking at this, and I, I must say this, I must give credit to the client. One of the directors, in fact, was the one who mooted out to us, hey, can we do something more? And I'll explain what th there is that uh, resulted to this uh, end design. But here, I think that the challenges uh, we took on was how do we break out from something that is so kind of mon monotonous? La, no? Can we introduce interest? Can we make it work better and all this sort of thing? Of course, the longhouse typology is not new. Uh, but we are not saying we directly copy from the longhouse. But our longhouse here, if you really look at it, has been a typology that existed for many, many centuries. But if you look at the longhouse, they have, they have a reason you know, for their shape. Okay? And if you look at this, there is uh, the sloping roof. And there is a, a lot of use that they use on the top, like the attic. I think the point here is that a lot of times our current housing is that we do all these grand uh, houses with the roof and then we slack a uh, ceiling over it. So essentially building all those space for the rats. Right? So I think that's one of the first starting points. Can we leverage the shape so that we can make use of it? This drawing by Henley Ling Roth from the life of the longhouse if you look at all the longhouses, a very interesting component. They have all the row housing, the units, but they always have a communal space called the rye at the front. All right. In our current situation in terrace houses, you just have your houses, but you do not have the common space. So a marrying of the best of both worlds, our client... So this is how terrace house in a row... Okay, so this is the site plan. So one day when we were having a design meeting, our client said, since we all have the, um, if you look at the central spine, it used to be a guardhouse at the front, and then it was like green space in the middle, and then green space at the back. But green spaces are just green spaces, botwa, bose, not big, not small. You can't really use it, but yeah, it's better than nothing. So one of the directors said, you know what? We are here about building a community. Can we do a public building uh, like a clubhouse? Now, this might sound quite simple to West Malaysia because they have the Strata Tato Act. For us here, we do not have that yet. So in a development like this, right, that building, if we do it right, will be in no man's land. Okay, sorry, a bit being technical. But the client was committed, said, you know, we need a public space. And they were willing to sacrifice bottom line and say, take out one unit at the end. And if you see the blue little spot at the end, it's actually the clubhouse. We sacrifice one unit, so that row is only a row of seven. And we combine that sacrifice lot with the green space to do a clubhouse. All right. That might sound like a very, very good idea, but we were actually in the midst of construction already. So it means that we go back to SBA, do all that. But I mean, we have no regret it to this day that we actually was able to introduce because the clubhouse became the hub of community living. So I think for this particular project, I think it's dear to us in that it was able to really put community as first and foremost. The second thing was that we wanted to find a way that we can bring interest uh, to a very long block of house. Uh, all right? Like if you know the, the long houses, um, the, the terrace houses, is there a way we could create interest? So we did it in a very, very simple way. Uh, 
um, we call it accessorizing. Lah. Okay, if you, if you got a handphone, you know what I mean. You have your core handphone, and then you buy things that you decorate it, accessorize, like your screensaver, front, you flip. You buy things and you accessorize. In a way, that is like personalizing the product. All right? So we de de derive these screens that you could actually just attach them onto the front. In that you accessorize them, you can change the color, you could change the material, and you could actually give every house an individual front. Right? But of course, there's a limit to what a development you can do. La. So we only ended up with two screens, two colors, and, uh, and the buildings themselves, you also can accessorize them with different colors. So very simple strategies that we can bring interest to the design. The other thing we did was, uh, you remember we, we talked about the big roof. Now, if you have lived in a terrace house, you know what I mean. All the terrace houses at the corner, you are okay. You are like a semi-D. You have light coming from the tree side. But if you are in the intermediate unit, you only have lights coming from both ends, the front and the back. So for this, we are saying, hey, why don't we try to bring light into every unit? So that was our challenge. Right? The way we did that was through the section. Again, we combined the idea about leveraging the profile of the space. We tuck the upstairs toilet together, all right? Because toilet has lower ceiling space, we put it right into the middle. Because it's lower ceiling space, in fact, you realize that on the top, you have another room that you could use perhaps as the fifth room, all right? So it can leverage the height. And then we introduce a huge light well in form of a jack roof in the middle so that the roof allows for cross ventilation. It also allows for light to come in. But at the same time, we can shut it so that you can still aircon it. So simple strategies like that, that allow us to, to play with the spatial planning. So this is an isonometric view. Um, sorry, it's a little bit hard to read, but if you really look at the roof, um, the profile of the roof allows us to actually have more volumetric rooms that have sloping roofs for master bedroom. You have the attic and all that. Okay. So this is some of the accessorizing of the components. Of course, it came early, was the original sketches was like green spaces. and So these are some of the accessories. So you could see that they could be personalized. The clubhouse as a counterpoint to the pitch roof because we need to build it very quickly. We build it out of steel and they were expressed as clean uh, glass boxes. As a counterpoint, the guard house was also done the same way so that they provided some differentiation to the main terrace house. And we wanted to use one component to do all our screens. All right, so we use one particular aluminum profile, and that's about building affordability, creating different screens that we can duplicate for the uh, house, even the clubhouse. And some of the shading um, of the building at the end, because most of the units faces north-south, but the end units, right, they are all facing east-west in the morning, afternoon sun. So we devised this simple screen that you could put in front of the windows to basically reduce glare and to control sunlight, but you can still look through it. And these are just derived from off-the-shelf basic components that we, we work with our manufacturer. So the design was uh, meticulously detailed and we incorporated landscape into the design as well. Okay, the last project is um, essentially a project done by interns, students in the office and, and I think the challenge for this 
project is really about building with very, very little. Now, I want to have just a quick comment about student interns because if I can say anything, they are very, very important people in, in our office. Interns have actually brought so much freshness and new ideas, but as interns, actually, they are not really ready for work. Okay? So while you can put them on project, and I've, we have also committed the same sin, is that they're actually not really ready to work. But they are much ready to give ideas. And we are very, very honoured to be given this opportunity to work with Barefoot Mercy to uh, do this uh, kindi in Long Laman. It's a pro bono project that um, I'll, I'll skim through it very quickly uh, because it's, it's interesting in that it is a project that... Um, that building with like very, very little, you know, essentially. And I think when we started off this project, we, we have always romanticized uh, the rural, like how we want to you know, uh, make a change to our rural environment and all that. But yet, when we were down on the road, we realized the big challenge, uh, kind of like the rubber touched the road. Um, but just to start off, I think we took inspiration from... Uh, this very famous Sabahan um, painter, her name is Tina Raymer, and uh, she did a series of uh, sketches of the rural kampongs that she visited. And if you see something that's something very, very romantic about her painting, because it captured the innocence of the rural condition, and, and not just the rural condition, but the faces of the innocent people. And I think when we were very privileged involved in this project, we, we really managed to see some of this and experience firsthand, you know, some of this warmth. All right, so those are some of the students who were involved. Just to give you an idea of the, the logistics, I'll go very fast on this part. So it's about a flight to Miri, and then you have to take... Another six hours drive. So, and this is the rapids that you have to shoot as you go up. And this is uh, Long Laman. Right. So it's a very interesting situation. As in, they have an existing tadika which is very, very run down. So our plan was to actually not do the tadika there, take down the building on the left-hand side and build a new tadika and reconfigure um, the, the, the existing tadika into a boarding house. So that was the brief. So the students came together and mind you, they had lots of ideas. I think we came up with about eight or nine skins, but very, very good ideas that essentially did not really work. Okay, because for one, right, we realized later on that none of the people who build these things look at drawing. They cannot understand drawing. So a lot of things that we drew, right, to them uh, was just black and white. When they look at drawing, uh, we just said, hey, you cannot see, man. It can't be a tilt ball. He couldn't, know. we couldn't get through. We came up with all this beautiful drawing, 3D, all these things, huh? And they couldn't understand, you know. And we had problems working with them. Uh, but our plans were very simple. And one of the things is about these people, right, they actually do not live indoor. They live outdoor. So it's very different from our condition. For us, we live indoor. They live in the outdoor. So the design we realized later on is not to build, just give them a roof and give them a big space. All right? So the, we did all this compartment and all this, like, no timber boxes that jut out, you know, very modern kind of. It can't be tong. We don't know why is it also, right? So in the end, we ah the model that one they can roughly understand, <laughs> roughly only, all right. So we had a real big challenge. So uh, we had all the plans. So what do we do with it? So we came up with a good good idea. The contractor who helped us came up with this idea. They just has to show you who they are. These are our clients lah. Okay, 
This is their, this is their hobby, you know? this is their game. This is what they do all the time. Just like catch small little rats, play with the birds, pets. Ah. You know, we all play phone, game, gaming. No, this is their game. Ah. So this is the kind of life that they lived, you know, and we thought that we all come in with our plans, right? Know everything, but we didn't know them at all, right? So in the process, I think we learn how to relate to them. And these are just kids are running out in the wild. But nonetheless, I think they do need the building. Right? They need a place where they can actually at least study when there's uh, light in the night time. So there are also practical needs. Right? They need to learn how to count, how to write. So, so our brilliant contractor, he said, okay, he took the whole plan back to his factory and he built a life-size model. Every truss, every rafter, every baton, all the floor truss, ah, he can't quite tong. Ah, he understand. All right, so it, it looks something like that. So we carried the whole thing in the boat. Actually, not me la, I did. Uh, it was all done by the students, all right? It was a great, great outing for them. They enjoyed themselves. They carried the whole model uh, to the site. And they started construction, all right? So all this done by the local guys. Now, very, very simple thing. I tell you why projects like this are very good for interns. Because for once, right, you know how hard is it to dig a bloody power cap. They actually had to physically dig. They had to literally do setting out drawing. They literally had to carry the weight of the pole that they designed. Uh. Sometimes they design it, wow, so big, you know. The pole uh, is 200 by 200. You know? But you carry that thing up the river, uh, your, your column will become 100 by 100 immediately. Alright? So there's a lot of this kind of like, we realize they learn from the actual construction. You realize how hard things are done on site. So, very, very simple plan, just a roof and then a big room. That's it. Now, can we introduce things that are new to them? Yes, you can. Right? If they can understand, they can build it, they will like it. So, we introduce simple elements, folding doors. Right? Doors that you can fold and you can open so that it can become a room and yet you can pivot them and then it becomes like a big uh, entrance out to the terrace. They love the terraces. So this is when it, it was built. And, and we had opportunities to think about how they use the building, not just building it, but they are in between spaces that we could modify. And these are some of the ideas that the students came up. Why don't you do a swing? Well, of course, at time, the gravel base was done. It, it would have been better if it was not gravel. But actually, they don't mind because all they need is something that's not wet on the bottom. All right, so they're actually quite okay with that. Simple things, recycle bamboo as gutter. Just make do with what you have. Just build. And it may look easy here, but honestly, to just tell them these things, right, it's not easy. But... They, they caught on and there are simple details like that. And then we gave it a coat of colour. And I think they absolutely loved it. Recycled bamboos uh, as screens, as stores. So I think those things were added on as they built. So this, this is a, a very iconic picture to me. Uh, it shows our, uh, one of the Barefoot Mercy founder, Anna Wee. Uh, and she was there, kind of like, at the same time, spending time with the kids. And it, it really drew me back to Tina Ramer's painting, you know, of the marketplace. And I think that's about how communities are made and how real um, relationships are fostered through the process of building. Uh, it's, it's quite well used, the building. I'm going to close uh, this segment by just talking a little bit, just in passing, about some of the big questions that we need to ask ourselves as architects. The strategies that we do on the local condition, 
can that actually be applied onto addressing global issues? So I'm going to just showcase maybe some of the projects that we are currently investigating together with our clients. Not all of them are real. There are some at proposal stage, but I think in intent, they are real. We intend to see how we can use these simple propositions and then scale it up to our urban situation. Kuching is growing and there are a lot of questions that we need to ask. And we, we need to ask what we call the big questions. And this is where architects as thinkers, as uh, disruptors to what is currently... You are trained to do that, you know, to, to ask big questions. Like, is hydrogen the answer? You know? is, is the future of Sarawak tied to new Malaysia or new Indonesia? You, you got to ask some of these questions to help you think about what's going to happen to Kuching in the years to come. So I think it's about scaling, it's about how we apply some of the concepts that we took for our local situation and apply it onto a bigger scale. So we ask, and this is a project that we are working together with our partners in uh, Mel Melbourne and uh, in, in KL, and they are talking about issues like building in a very dense area. In, this is a project in Cambodia. Uh, about can we actually, uh, in a, the uh, city that is growing, can we actually introduce the courtyard typology? A lot of these things have to do with courtyard, about how people live, so that you have a situation whereby all the units, instead of going high, can they go wide? All right. So I think this is very applicable to Sarawak, whereby we have land. Do we always need to go high rise? Can we go wide? Okay, so these are big big questions. So we're just going to run through them by, by means of just showing some ideas. So essentially, it's about living in the tropics, again, uh, looking into the courtyard and all that. And I, I think the, the building now is, I think, topping up and probably will be done in another year. The other thing is that can we use the typology, the courtyard, and scale it up then onto a high-rise? Right? Does all the high-rise that we do, all the apartments that we do, does it always have to be double-fronted with a single corridor? Can it be single corridor, look into the courtyard? The answer is, of course, yes, you can. Can you bring the ground onto different layers of your building? Can you create pocket buildings in between your floors. I think so. These are one of the projects that we are exploring with our client in Kuching. And it's, it's about a high rise but interspersing 10% rather than green on the floor. The green is at various points of the building and they become like public spaces. So the building need not always be so solid looking. Can it embrace a courtyard? and make the whole experience more pleasant and bring more value, I think, to, to people rather than just coming back, open up the lift and you have a long corridor. Can you arrive at the courtyard? So these are some of the questions that we're exploring. In apartments, that as we are building, the same issues that we experience in prison lungs, we want to transpose it onto a high-rise. Can our apartment be individualized? Can they actually have identity by themselves? Yes, you can. Instead of building all your units looking like straight at, at just one side, you can always tilt it. All right, you can tilt every unit so that the tilting can maximize prospect. It can catch the right sun orientation and yet having an interesting expression a bit of individual personal, personalization again. This is a project that we are working uh, with our client in uh, Papua New Guinea uh, for a 30-storey building. And, and there, it's again the same. Can, do, we, do our office building always have to be just a, a box of glass? Can it actually be fragmented in such a way that you create pocket gardens in between the buildings? 
by tilting the core, shifting some of the components of the office, you actually could create an interlocking of spaces with green spaces in between. Okay, the last project is actually a project that is um, on a very, very small plot of land. And here the question is that even on a very small plot of land, can we splice a part of the city into the tower? Can we graph garden onto a small plane? And I think this project is challenging because it really requires us again to work together with the structural engineer, our M&E, our interior designer, to come to a total solution, an anamorphic way of working, whereby we leverage on the structural design. And in this case, the building doesn't have any column in between. You only have one giant column at the corner. All right, that one giant corner allows us then to actually cut part of the building and slice it and introduce three pocket gardens, one on the ground, one in the middle, and one on the rooftop. So on the ground, you arrive at a splice corner, you see a huge column. So that is the one column that holds the whole building up. So it's a transfer beam girder design onto one column. So it's a structural solution. The roof garden also takes advantage of the slice to introduce garden into an otherwise basic conventional office uh, apartment. So, so these are some of the big questions. Uh, I think they are topping up uh, the big column, uh, I think, um, even as we speak. So architecture in ending, it's really about people. It is for the people. It is not the forefront, but it's a backdrop to our human activities. And I think over the years, we have been very fortunate to work, grow in Kuching, um, fall in love with the place, fall in love with the people, fall in love with the work. And I think if there's anything at all about our own commitment is, is the design of our own house for our own children. All right, so I'll just show some slides of the small little prairie house that we built. It's not a great grand house, but it means a lot to my client, all right, who's happened to sit at the back, and my two children, because they grew up in a very simple house. Oops. Thank you very much. I think time is up. No, no. So, okay. I don't know why we jumped that, but is there a way I could go back? Because I only had three more slides. Um, uh, we, we grew up, we grew up um, in, in um, of course, we grew up in Penang, but me and my wife both from Penang. I think we have stayed in Kuching longer than we have been in, in Penang, so I'm the facto Kuching person. Lah. But my children, they are true blue Kuchingite, right? So, so I, I'm just trying to... Um, show you some slides about how they grew up. Oh, okay, thanks, thanks. I think we are back. Okay. So I think we live with, with my children, they live with architecture all their lives. Joyce was born in the time when I was very involved in architecture and, and she grew up in that environment. Okay, thanks. I think we are back. So I think what I'm trying to say is that architecture really is a backdrop to our human lives. And it provides the place where we meet, we gather, we form relationships, we form communities. And in the same way, I think Kuching, in a nutshell, allows the architects actually to come together. And we're very privileged, you know, uh, to be in Kuching and to have something like this happening. In a way, it's like a big family as well. And my kids uh, grew, grew up with me. Um, and, and now, 26 years later, she's... She's a grown woman. And my second daughter, uh, she also have, uh, for some strange reason, I don't know why, 
decided to take up architecture. <laughs> and recently, I, I saw some of her. Uh, okay, so this is some of her work, and uh, she's graduating uh, next month, All right? So what I'm trying to say is that actually it come a full circle uh, for me to start work and eventually to set up my own firm and then see some of my younger people gone on and set up their own firm. All I'm trying to say is that actually this is the cycle of life. And I think for all that, we have to be thankful to God who has really graced our lives and uh, help us build, I think, a very, very meaningful community here in Kuching. And I look at her drawings, I'm, I'm impressed. I know there's a Chinese idiom la, that says, uh, you may have heard of before, Gong Qing Chu Yu Lan, Sun Yu Lan, right? So I think that also applies to Vun, right? You are the green, la. I'm the blue, la. the green better than the blue. Something like that, literally translation. I think priest is the green, all right? And it came from the blue, all right? So, there is legacy, there is about honouring, there's about relationship. So I think we've got to learn to honour our generation that has gone past us, the who was. We have to honour our current new stars, the who is. And of course, there's the stars of the future, the who is to come. All right? And I think that completes my talk. <laughs>